And for this class is fairly large, high level, so we will only cover it at a high, level, high scale. So first, we need to understand what a heat engine is, and we have actually seen this uh, several times already in this class. Um, the heat engine is basically a system that converts heat into work. And generally, this could be heat coming from light, or it could be fuel. And the idea is that whatever heat is generated is then applied to do work. And this could be motion, or it could even be electricity. So keep in mind, when we say work in thermodynamics, that doesn't necessarily mean mechanical work. It could also be electrical work. As we all know, you know, motor is doing electrical to mechanical. So this is the probably the simplest form, one of the simplest forms of a heat engine, where you have a hot area, in this case heating in water. So it's a temperature T1. It evaporates, it becomes, um, it touches a cold area, okay, up here at a temperature T2, and, and, and then it pushes a piston. Okay, this expanding steam pushes a piston, which turns a wheel. So that's the work output output is the moving wheel, the heat input is the input. Okay? And of course we can define this entire system here as a closed system and define lots of thermodynamics around it, which is exactly what we do. So the key concepts to understand are the heat difference is used to generate electricity or generate energy. Okay, this is again we've seen this several times. I will repeat it until it becomes you know intuition. Then uh, the examples, of course, are coal plants, nuclear power plants, solar thermal plants, geothermal plants, uh, also thermoelectric devices like the Peltier device that we saw in the last lecture. Okay. A, another simple example that all of us are familiar with is the internal combustion engine. So this is a very simple model of an internal combustion engine with a four-stroke type cycle. So. The system consists of basically a chamber here. It's called a combustion chamber. Okay. A, first, there is an input valve through which air fuel mixture comes in. Okay. There's a spark plug which initiates an explosion as we'll see soon. And there's an exhaust valve which is close to the very beginning during intake. So first, there's the air fuel mixture comes in which pushes the piston down. Okay, this piston is connected to this crankshaft which turns the wheel, okay, axle. So first uh, we have the air fuel mixture is drawn in, so everything is drawn in. So it's rotating in that direction. The valves are then closed, okay, and there's compression. So it continues rotating, okay, so this chamber is now compressed, so high pressure, low volume. And we'll come to a pressure volume curve soon, so keep that in mind. Air fuel mixture is compressed. There's a lot of potential energy there. And then the spark plug fires, which creates a chemical reaction, which is an explosion, which creates uh, products at a very, very high pressure. So they have to expand. Right? So the explosion expands the gas and pushes the piston down, which forces this to rotate again. Okay. And the last part of the cycle, basically as it rotates, the exhaust valve is opened and the, and the um, exhaust gas are pushed up. And the cycle repeats again. Okay. Again, this is an example, this internal combustion engine is something we're very familiar with, but it's an example of a heat engine. A heat engine can be thought of in a, in a, in a very general form, internal combustion engine. Of course, in, in, um, in academics, we will think about this from a very theoretical point of view, which is why we're talking about you know, heat engines. So you can have various different kinds of conversions of energy. You can have light being converted to electricity, which is, of course, photovoltaic effect. You can have light being converted to fuel, which is um, something like fuel cells uh, or um, solar fuel generation. Uh, of course, in nature, that's photosynthesis. Right. Um, or you can have fuel to motion, um, and that, and again, that's it. All, all those are different kinds of heat engines, essentially energy con conversion systems. Photovoltaics, photosynthesis, biofuels, hydro, wind, tidal, etc. Now, for us, from a practical point of view, we need to know what the efficiencies are because this really drives the cost and adoption, right? Use of these technologies. 
So electric generators generally can be quite efficient. Mechanic, this is mechanical to electrical, greater than 80% efficiency. Electric motors are the opposite. Electrical to mechanical generally can also be very efficient, greater than 90% efficiency. Of course, this depends on, we talked about this before, this depends a little bit on how it's used. So, for instance, if this motor is running at variable speeds, then this efficiency drops quite fast. But if this very high efficiency can be achieved if you're all, always at a constant speed, rotational speed in this particular case. Uh, you can have light to heat, uh, which can have you know 90% efficiency if it's concentrated therm solar thermal systems. Uh, you can also have chemical to heat, um, which is of course burning fuel, which can also be 90% efficient. Of course, the problem with chemical to heat is that you usually end up with toxic side byproducts, which uh, can pollute uh, the environment. So we need to consider those things as well. Now, in uh, heat engines, the most important thing to keep in mind is the fact that there are limiting efficiencies. So there are theoretical limits to what efficiencies can be achieved. And in thermodynamics, places the upper limits on these efficiencies. Okay? So of course we want these efficiencies to be as high as possible, but the thermodynamic limits um, limits what we can achieve, which means that we need to understand what those limits are. So we can understand, okay, how well is our system performing. So thermodynamic limits uh, for a heat to mechanical system is defined by what's called a Carnot limit. We'll see this again, but just to, uh, this equation is simply 1 minus the temperature of the cold part divided by the temperature of the hot part. So these are heat engines, solar thermal systems, and so on. So from this expression, you can see that if the temperature of the cold part and the hot part are the same, then it becomes 1 minus 1, it becomes 0. So it's not producing any energy. But if the temperature of the cold part is very small, temperature of the hot part is very high, then this number here goes to very small values, which means that you're getting close to 1 or 100% efficiency. So you really want to make the cold part very cold, hot part very hot, to get this efficiency to be high. Yeah, but of course there are problems with that, as we will see later on. Um, light to electrical energy is uh, for photovoltaics. Again, just keep in mind that even in photovoltaics, the limit, the thermodynamic limit is still defined by that. Of course, in that case, the hot part would be the sun, because light's coming from the sun. The cold part will be the temperature, the ambient temperature at which the solar cell is. We will also talk about that later on. Um, light to fuel is a similar situation. Of course, it's much lower as photosynthesis. The efficiencies are generally a little bit lower as well. Okay, so the basic principles uh, are uh, enshrined in basically two laws, which we call the first law of thermodynamics, which is essentially an energy conservation law, and then the second law of thermodynamics, which talks about entropy. Okay, so. The first law of thermodynamics is, is uh, stated mathematically as delta U equals Q minus W. Now delta U, so here we're talking about a closed system, a system where there is no, uh, there are boundaries, so no matter can go in and out. Now energy can come, or heat can come in and out, but not matter. So delta U refers to change in the internal energy, and we'll talk about what that internal energy means uh, in, a, in, a few, in the next few slides. But the change in the internal energy of the system is balanced by the amount of heat added to the system, which is Q, minus the work done by the system, which is W. Okay, and that's a very fundamental thing, if you think about it, it's basically conservation of energy. So let's think a little bit more detail about it. The first law of thermodynamics refers to the increase in the internal energy of a closed system. So closed system is important because it means that the system is not allowing the material or matter to go in and out, is equal to the total of the energy added to the system. Okay minus work done by the system so the net energy added to the system so specifically the energy entering the system is supplied as heat and if energy leaves the system as work which is generally the case in most heat engines the heat is accounted for as positive so this q is considered as a positive number and the work is 
is negative, which is why you have a negative sign here. So heat minus work done is the internal energy of the system. Okay, so that's relatively straightforward. Now, of course, these closed systems are not static. They're because they are receiving heat from the outside and they're doing work, which means that something is happening, right? They're not just sitting still, like the like the internal combustion engine, for instance, right? It's moving. So there, there is some cycle happening, and we refer to this as a thermodynamic cycle. So in the case of a thermodynamic cycle of a closed system, which returns to its original state, just like the internal combustion engine comes back to its original state, so it's a cycle, the heat, Q in, supplied to the system in one stage of the cycle, minus the heat, Q out, removed from it, in another stage of the cycle, plus the work added to the system W in equals the work that leaves the system W out. It's basically restating this equation. Okay? So, in other words, the change in the internal energy of a system during a full cycle, and we'll see what that means uh, with some examples shortly, uh, it really means that it goes through a, it, into a cycle. It means that the initial state and the final state of the cycle are the same which means that the change in internal energy of the system is zero. Therefore, the heat entering the cycle minus heat leaving the cycle plus work uh, being done on the cycle, uh, sorry, on the system minus the work done by the system should all match. They should cancel out. Okay, QE equals W net. This equals zero in a cycle because you're starting at the same state and ending up at the same state. So, so we can uh, go to a very specific case. In the particular case of a thermally isolated system, which is uh, also referred to as adiabatically isolated, we'll come back to what adiabatically isolated means. But let's imagine a situation where it's completely thermally isolated from the outside. In other words, no heat can come in, so Q is zero. The change of internal energy of an adiabatically isolated system can only be the result of the work added to the system. Because of the adiabatic assumption is Q equals zero. So if Q equals zero, and then delta U of the system is U final, internal energy at the end minus U initial, which is internal energy at the beginning, is W in minus W out. So that's a thermally isolated system. So if you have a completely thermally isolated system. Uh, these uh, distinctions are important in different situations, so we'll look at some examples. But, the, you know, there's quite a lot of abstract concepts here, but most important things are somewhat uh, common sense, so let's try to distill them out. What are the key ideas from, from a conceptual understanding? Number one, of course, is conservation of energy. You know, energy put into the system, energy taken out of the system, should match whatever change in the internal energy of the system. The second, uh, and so that's pretty simple. The second concept is this concept of internal energy. We haven't talked too much about it, and it's not very um, easy for most people to uh, appreciate. So let's take a quick, uh, closer look at this. Okay, really, the internal energy refers to um, energy of the constituent components of a system, which could be molecules forming, you know, a material. It could be, you know, uh, planets uh, moving around in a solar system. So if you think the solar system as a, as a system, as a heat system, let's say. So it really depends on how you define the system. So let's, le let's take a look at how it's defined. If the system has a definite temperature, then its total energy has three distinguishable components, okay? So energy, of course, can be in motion. If the system is in motion as a whole. It has kinetic energy. We know that. If the system as a whole is in an externally imposed force field, let's say like gravity, then it has potential, or it could also be electrostatic potential, right? Like the, uh, this force field could be uh, not only gravity, but it could also be, for instance, in a photovoltaic cell or a solar cell, you have the electric field, right? Could be an electric field. So all, any of that can result in potential energy relative to some reference point in space. And thirdly, it has internal energy. Internal energy is a fundamental quantity of thermodynamics, and um, it really establishes the, the difference between work done into the system and work done by the system. 
uh, heat input into the system work done by the system. So the establishment of the concept of internal energy distinguishes the first law of thermodynamics from the more general law of conservation of energy. So the E total of the system is the kinetic energy of the system plus the potential energy of the system plus the internal energy of the system. So uh, again, you know, from a microscopic point of view, the internal energy of a substance can be explained as the sum of the diverse kinetic energies of the erratic microscopic motions of its constituent atoms, which is what I was saying before, and of the potential energy of the interactions between them. So it could be the air molecules, right, moving around. So if you have a chamber filled with air, the internal energy of the system is simply the kinetic energy of the air molecules within that system, within that chamber, and any collisions, right, potential energy resulting in the collisions. So those microscopic energy terms are collectively called the substance's internal energy or U and are accounted for by macroscopic thermodynamic properties. So of course we won't go into that level of detail, we'll extract, we will essentially abstract it out. The total of the kinetic energies of microscopic motions of the constituent atoms increases as the system's temperature increases. So we know as things get hot, they start moving more. So the kinetic energy of those microscopic motions increases. We'll see that again, but just keep that uh, in mind. This assumes no other interactions at the microscopic level of the system, such as chemical reactions, potential energy of constituent atoms with respect to each other. Okay, so it, it's a it's a bit abstract, uh, not terribly important for us to know in great detail, but you need to understand uh, conceptually what you know that there is something like an inter something called an energy and how it relates to work done by a system and heat input into a system. Now work done by a system is the other concept in the first law. It is a process of transferring energy into or out of a system that can be described by microscopic mechanical forces exerted from outside the system. So it's kind of a specific transfer of energy, right? It's not just heat. Flow of heat is also a form of energy transfer. Well, work is when there is a macroscopic mechanical forces. So it's a little bit of a distinction that we should think about as well. Now work, like I said before, need not just be my mechanical, so that's a little bit of a misnomer. It can also be electrical, right? You can have a current flow to a resistor. And we'll see, of course, examples of those as well. So the, I know this, uh, these topics are a little bit dry and a little bit um, abstract. So my recommendation is kind of Think about it yourself for a little bit, you know, and, and really think about how these concepts might apply to your particular system that you're working on in your project. And that's really the way to, to gain intuition and understanding of these concepts by really looking at specific examples. Okay, so the second law of thermodynamics, where, which uh, I think I kind of went through here, is saying that the entropy of a system always increases or stays the same, uh, which is or, uh, this is the change in entropy as a function of time. S is entropy, delta of S is the change in function of time. It's always greater than or equal to zero. So coming back here, it basically indicates something very very fundamental. It indicates that natural processes are irreversible. In other words, uh, if you um, break a coffee cup. Uh, it is basically impossible to put it, all the pieces back together. Now you might say you can move to, uh, you know, time back, but the, the thermodynamics prevents you from it. Uh, and really from a more, more larger scale, this is like the Big Bang, right? The universe is expanding, and uh, that expansion is irreversible. Of course, there are theories which talk about, um, you know, acceleration and so on, but that's actually not true anymore. It's already proven that the expansion is accelerated. So the other uh, outcome of the second law of thermodynamics is that temperatures tend to equalize. This is a very important concept for us, uh, which basically means that if you have um, in a closed system, if you have a hot end and a cold end, and you do nothing to this closed system, they will essentially thermally equalize. In other words, the hot end will start reducing its temperature and the whole cold and start increasing its temperature until both they both meet and the whole system reaches a single temperature. And that's actually a very important idea and we will use this again. So uh, just to 
think about this in a more complete sense when two initially isolated systems in separate but nearby regions of space each in thermodynamic equilibrium with itself but not necessarily with each other are then allowed to interact they will eventually reach a mutual thermodynamic equilibrium okay so there are two isolated systems but they're allowed to interact they will reach a thermal equilibrium or thermodynamic equilibrium this also means that the sum of the entropies of the initially isolated systems, so if you add up the entropy of each of those systems, it will always be less than or equal to the total entropy of the final combination. Okay, uh, let me repeat that. Can you hear me still? Okay, let me, maybe you want to turn off the video just in case. Okay. Okay. So, uh, is this any better, Apita? Yeah, yeah. Give it a second. It's gonna show up. Is it? Uh, what's happening? The sound or the? Uh, let me try without the connector. Maybe this is better. I'll see. Actually, this is better. Okay. This, okay. This is much better. Right? Okay. Well, let, let's see how it goes. Let's just keep this instead of the earphones. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. So the basic idea is that if you take the entropy of each of the individual systems and add them up, that entropy will always be uh, greater than the, um, uh, sorry, it will always be less than the total entropy of the final combination. This basically shows or means that the entropy always has to increase with regard to time. Okay. Uh, just a few, uh, the quality here occurs just when the two original systems have all their respective intensive va uh, variables, which is temperature and pressure, as we'll see some examples. Um, uh, and then the final system also has the same values. So th this is uh, less important for us. This is referred to as that abiotic condition. We'll look, we'll see that later on when we talk about some examples. But for now, don't worry about it. So the conclusion here is that the entropy of a closed system always increases with time. Those are the only two import, uh, big concepts in thermodynamics we really need to think about. So now let's look at some examples of heat engines and cycles. Okay. Um, so heat engine again can be abstracted in, in, into a system that converts heat to work and can be abstracted in, in a form like this where you have a hot source at a high temperature TH which is sending heat into the system okay so that's our heat engine the Q in is the input it, and this engine then does work represented by W but in addition to doing work it can also lose heat to a sink at the core part of the system, which is T at a lower temperature Tc, Q out. Okay, the Carnot efficiency we saw before defines the maximum possible efficiency of a heat engine. So, the heat engine, the operation of a heat engine can be represented by what's referred to as a heat engine cycle. Okay, this represents essentially a curve, generally speaking. Uh, there are many ways to represent it, just be aware of it, but uh, most cases we represent it as a pressure volume curves. Okay, so you can see pressure on the vertical axis, volume on the horizontal axis. So let's follow what this means. First of all, the Carnot efficiency is the same as what we saw before. It's the difference in temperature between the hot and the cold divided by the temperature of the hot divided by and multiplied by 100%. Okay, so this is the same equation we saw before. We'll see this again many times, so no, let's not worry about it too much. So let's start here at this point of the cycle. Okay, this is a point where, let's say, the working material, which can be a gas, for instance, is at a low volume. So volume is at very low, so it's compressed, very high pressure. Okay, 
and it's allowed to expand. Okay, so this red curve here represents nice with thermal expansion. And as we know from our example of the refrigerator, for instance, this expansion means that you are drawing heat in from the surroundings. Right? You're absorbing the heat. So you're cooling the surrounding or cooling the chamber if it's a case of the refrigerator. Right? So that's that part here. And this happens at uh, TH. It can be isothermal, but it doesn't have to be. This is a specific example of an isothermal expansion when the temperature of this uh, fluid is the same. And then there's something called an adiabatic expansion where the temperature can change. In this case, the temperature uh, falls. It goes from TH to TC. But really, it's also undergoing an expansion. But in this case, it's also expanding and reducing in pressure. So at this point of the cycle, you have the fluid at very large volume, right? The volume is here, but below pressure. So it's existing as a gas. Now, you can compress that gas, let's say, uh, by isothermal compression. It doesn't need to be isothermal. So it's just an example here at, let's say, TC, which then reduces the volume, increases the pressure. But of course, when you compress it, the heat comes out. So that compressor, of course, generates heat, as you remember from the example of the refrigerator. Then there's an adiabatic compression, okay, which is basically energy conserving com compression and it comes back to its initial state. So, if you think about the cycle, this repeats over and over again, you notice something, that it is not going back in the same cycle, right? Going down is in this curve, and going back is in this curve. And the difference between these two curves is equal to the work done by the system. And this is an important con concept. So the network is the area inside the pressure volume curves. So you really want to maximize that area when you start thinking along this uh, for these curves. Okay, and of course the work done by the system is the difference between the heat coming into the system minus the heat escaping the system. Right, assuming the internal energy of the system does not change. Of course, if the internal energy of the system changes, then you have to apply the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, so that's an example of a heat engine cycle. Here's another example of a cycle referred to as a Stirling engine. It's a little bit different. Um, you'll see the difference. But you can also achieve the Carnot efficiency. In this case, it's also a pressure volume curve. Like, uh, let's say we start at the point A. This is low volume, uh, mid moderate pressure. And then you, at a fixed volume, you increase the pressure to B. So that's this uh, straight line. And then you allow for expansion at a constant temperature. So this is an isothermal expansion where the pressure drops, volume increases. And then there is a drop in temperature from the hot to the cold with a consequent drop in pressure but at the same volume, constant volume. And then there's a compression. So this compression happens isothermally as well at a fixed temperature Tc. So during these vertical lines, of course, uh, no heat transfers. So that's why this is adiabatic, similar to the blue portions of the curve, and there's no heat going in and out. But in the, during this uh, expansion and compression, heat comes in or heat goes out. And the difference, of course, is the work done, which is the area under this curve. So it's just a different cycle, referred to as the Stirling cycle, and the difference is that there's a, this constant volume phase of it. So for, for, my, for our purposes, the key things to keep in mind is Carnot's theorem. Carnot's theorem states that all irreversible heat engines between two heat reservoirs, which is the hot and the cold ends, are less efficient than a Carnot engine operating between the same reservoirs. So which means that the, the best time efficiency that one can hope to achieve with any heat engine is given by this expression. Okay. So we can try to, let's say you're working on a solar thermal project, you can think about, okay, this is the best I can hope to do. What is my hot part? What is my cold part? And I can calculate that. Same thing with, uh, you know, solar desalination for that matter. So there is a Carnot efficiency associated with that specific heat engine. This concept also implies that all reversible heat engines between two heat reservoirs are equally efficient with the Carnot engine operating between the reservoirs. Uh, which means that if you have a reversible heat engine, which of course does not exist in actual nature, 
they are all equivalent. In other words, if you design one theoretically, it will be basically same as any other one. This is a little bit of an abstract concept, not so important for us, but it's a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics. Let's not worry too much about it. Okay, now uh, the last thing I uh, want to talk about is, is a specific example, and that, that's just the last topic that I want you to understand. We'll think, we'll apply what we have learned so far to look at a very simple example of a solar collector. Okay, so let's walk through this slowly. The efficiency of a solar collector can be written as, so the total efficiency is here, okay, eta, is a product of the efficiency of a collector and the efficiency of the heat engine associated with that collector. So imagine there is some way to collect the sunlight and heat up the hot part, then there's a Carnot engine associated with that hot part and there's another cold part, which gives you the total efficiency. So we need to compute all these different terms here. First, we'll start with the Carnot because that's easy to compute, right? It's one minus Tc over Th. Tc is the temperature of the cold part. Th is the temperature of the hot part. Eta of the collector is a bit more complicated, okay? We have to look at the absorbed heat by the collector, which could be a, you know, let's say hot water heater with a concentrator, whatnot, minus the heat lost. This is, uh, we'll talk primarily about radiative loss, as we said before. Well, we'll come to that in a second. Divided by incident heat, okay, which is, of course, the sunlight. Now, the heat lost is usually primarily radiative, so that's why there's an equal greater than sign here. Okay, of course, it can have other loss mechanisms like conduction, convection, and so on, but we'll only consider radiation radiative losses for the moment, uh, where sigma Th, so it's at high temperature, so that's the Th, sigma Th raised to 4, of course, is the Stefan-Boltzmann law, which we saw last class. Okay, sigma is the Stefan-Boltzmann constant, T raised to 4. So this is the power density that's emitted by this absorber. It is multiplied by the area of the absorber, A, which gives me, this is watts per meter squared, multiplied by meter squared gives me watts and it has to be multiplied by something called emissivity because different things emit at different rates or different uh, different efficiencies so that kind of adjusts the number a little bit emissivity is something which varies between zero and one so uh, very highly emissive materials have this uh, emissivity equal to one for for most so uh, good black bodies, this will be closer to 1. So we'll assume that's 1 for the time being. The incident, of course, is the sunlight. Uh, so first of all, there's the intensity of the sunlight, high solar, or the insulation, as we saw before. It's in watts per meter squared. Multiplied by the area of the, either the area of the collector, okay, or the area of the collector multiplied by the concentration factor. So you might have a big collector, like a big uh, Fresnel lens, let's say, on top of the collector, which increases your input aperture. So remember the very first lecture I mentioned the input aperture is important. This is where how it becomes important. Here the area is multiplied by the geometric concentration factor. We'll see this again and again. So we'll look at specific examples. For now, just be aware of where this goes into play. This goes into play in the denominator. So we plug it all in, and we get a relatively simple expression where the efficiency of the collector now is, you know, Q absorbed minus Q lost over Q incident turns out to be 1 minus epsilon sigma T raised to 4 over C times I sold. So if you think about this like equation for a second, uh, epsilon is a constant, sigma is a constant. Okay, these two things are constants you don't have much control over. They don't have any control over, so let's ignore them for the time being. The temperature of the hot body is very, very important, as we expected, right? And there's a negative sign here, which means that I need to uh, increase if I, uh, this is a, very important, what happens if I increase that temperature? There's a negative sign here. The efficiency will go down, right? So this tells you, okay, I can, uh, having a hot, uh, part of the heat engine to be harder is good, but I'm going to increase my losses. So this will start going down. 
The concentration factor is also important. If I increase the concentration factor, of course, this efficiency goes up, right? Because this is in the denominator as a negative sign. Okay, so uh, AC is the A times C is a collector area. So it's a concentration factor multiplied by the area of the absorber itself. The absorber itself is the area C. So the total effort, now we can put everything together into the total efficiency, which is the area of the collector multiplied by the area defined by Carnot. So which works out to be this expression. So you can see two things competing against each other. So that's the most important thing I want you to get out of all these equations. Right? Look at TH. So TH here has a negative sign, which means that it contributes in a negative fashion. In other words, when this increases, this term decreases. Now here TH is in the denominator with a negative sign, which means that if TH increases here, this whole thing increases. And we know from Carnot that if I increase the temperature of the hot body, my efficiency goes up. So those are the two competing things that happen in these two terms. So if I multiply them together, I know that there is some optimal point. This is the most important conclusion I want you to draw. In almost all systems, there is almost there is always an optimum point of operation. And this is true for photovoltaics, this is true for uh, your car engine. It really comes from thermodynamics. So here we can look at this equation numerically. So the examples are plotted here. So vertical axis, uh, vertical axis is the efficiency, horizontal axis is the temperature of the hot source, or TH, this TH. And you can see various plots here, and those various plots correspond to different concentration factors. Okay, C. So let's look at C equal 10, so which is this black curve here. At low temperatures, uh, of course, when, when the TH is equal to TC, so in this case, TC is 300 Kelvin, which is the room temperature, the efficiency is zero, right? Because uh, TC and TH is equal to, equal to, they are equal to each other, so one minus one is zero, so that's zero. As I increase my TH, this plot increases until it reaches a peak value around 25-26%, uh, okay, in this example. And then, as I increase TH further, it doesn't help because I'm losing more energy because of these radiative losses and I start going down. Until very high temperatures, I, will, I, I reach zero. It's actually doing nothing. Right? So that's the interesting concept I want you to keep in mind. It's important not to just to think from a Carnot perspective, but also need to understand the losses. Of course, you, you have another knob you can play, which is this concentration factor. So then I can increase my concentration to 50 from 10, and I get this blue curve which means I can push the efficiency higher, my optimum efficiency higher. Okay, I can go to 100 and push this even higher. 500, 1000, 5000 and so on. When I increase the concentration, I also get a more uh, flatter curve here, which is good because you know I don't need to control the hot source temperature so precisely. So lots of nice advantages. But of course, we will see this as you increase the concentration factor the systems get more complicated, right? You need to track the sun more precisely. You're also working at much higher temperatures, which means that materials have to survive, so reliability becomes challenging. So all these trade-offs. This is why this is a very interesting engineering problem. Okay, so uh, I want to uh, end uh, a little early today, but uh, before we end, I want to show two examples of solar thermal plants, uh, which actually apply this this whole analysis. So this analysis we did in a more much more sophisticated manner is essentially applied to design these systems. So the first solar thermal plant you see on the left is a what's called a Sandia dish Stirling engine. So remember the Stirling cycle we talked about. It uses something very similar to that again with a steam. So there's a parabolic dish. In this case, it's a paraboloid, so it's a full 3D. Uh, the focus uh, is right there, okay? And there are pipes which allow the water to be heated up, and the steam passes through the pipes and runs a turbine. Usually, the turbine is off, off, uh, off uh, the site, but I am actually exactly not sure where it is in this diagram. The efficiency of this particular system is 30%. Concentration is about 2,000. So you can compare that to the curve here. Concentration of 2,000. So it's about this curve, roughly. This is 1,000, so a little higher than that. 
and uh, efficiency is about 30 percent so like way down here right down here somewhere temperature is usually pretty high uh, I forget the exact number yeah it's about 700 degrees also so you can kind of compare it to the theoretical numbers uh, it's actually quite good for, for the numbers here they are relatively large installations uh, primarily started at uh, this is development at uh, Sandia National Labs uh, some of these are installed in California with uh, about 25 kilowatt peak per dish the other way to implement these uh, sorts of heat systems is what's uh, shown here which is a, a solar tower um, or call a power tower this is an example from Spain but some of you probably have seen the one outside Las Vegas uh, it's closer to us. Uh, these can be very giant systems, so basically a bunch of mirrors or a very large area which focuses light, uh, sunlight to a specific spot. So as the sun moves, these mirrors uh, adjust to change their focus uh, of their reflection. And this uh, spot uh, fluid is heated up and that heated fluid uh, is used to perform work. Uh, Generally, in this example, it's 250 degrees Celsius steam turbine, so steam runs a turbine to create electricity. These systems can be massive, so this is 11 megawatts, but these areas are very big as well. We're talking about several miles in, in diameter. So, um, uh, so there are two other examples I just want to give you so you have a sense for what these things uh, look like. I know for the solar concentrator team, we will go into a bit more detail, but I think it's good for all of us to look at it. And this is the last part of the class, so I'm going to speed through this. Okay, so you can see the heliostats. They're called uh, heliostats. There are basically modular mirrors. Again, you can see the pictures there. And you can see the, the hot part. And I zoom on. Santiago's brought along one of these miniature parabolic mirrors, which I guess is almost like a perfect scale model of, of your solar tower. Yes, I mean, and the tower looks like in the middle of a circle of heliostats. And every yellow set is like, yeah, taking a different angle to reflect the light on top of the tower and then to concentrate all the energy on, on a single spot. So let me try. Let me try. <laughs> So, yeah, it's so, so the heliostat is essentially so discretizing the, the paraboloid structure. I mean, this must be the challenge that you're facing. Exactly. I mean, exactly what we have to be doing. I mean, we have to be very precise in moving the heliostats in the right position to concentrate the light there. Sunlight is reflected from each heliostat onto a central receiver at the top of the tower. Sodium and potassium nitrate salts are pumped from the cold salts tank up to the receiver where they absorb the concentrated solar thermal energy, reaching temperatures of up to 565 degrees. The heated salts are then pumped down to the hot salts tank where they can be stored in a molten state or used to generate electricity via the heat engine. This is the hot molten salt tank that contains the molten salts at 565 degrees. This is like a steam battery, but it's a thermal battery. It's not an electrical battery. But the energy which is accumulated here is enough to continue operating the turbine for 15 hours at full speed. So this is what distinguishes this place from other solar tower Exactly. generators around the world it's actually that storage exactly being able to store energy this way means the solar power can for the first time be provided 24 hours a day not just when the sun shining this is the vessel in which the water begins to speak inside you have water at maybe 500 degrees centigrade and already a hundred bars of pressure this is incredible so what Santiago is telling us is despite how futuristic this all looks the actual business end where they create the electricity is much the same as any other coal fired or even nuclear power plant. So see, it's a steam driven power plant. Wow. Wow, this is what I'm talking about. Now, this looks like a power station. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to... 
fast here, but you get an idea. Uh, this is, of course, closer to us, so it's uh, it's good to see. So if anyone has uh, driven by Vegas, you might have seen this. Uh, or if you fly, for instance, from Salt Lake to California, you actually fly over this. Uh, it's a basically the same kind of system. There are three of them. They're very big, as you can imagine. There are three systems, you can see. Um, and, and you can see the mirrors are changing, right? At different parts are on the two axis tracking here. You see these mirrors can trap in both, both axes. Uh, one of the problems with these sorts of systems that uh, you know you will encounter, and I, I should point out, is heat load. Uh, sorry, wind loading. So these things are not super. Um, uh, they have to be very stable to wind. You know, so there are big challenges on how do you make sure of that it makes it expensive. So lots of lots of interesting challenges to solve here, but very very exciting technology. It can, in theory, produce energy at um, costs that are much smaller than uh, traditional solar photovoltaics that we put on our roofs. But of course, it's centralized, so that's the trade-off. So I'm gonna start here. Uh, I'll post links to all the videos so if anyone's interested. Of course, feel free to look at it more closely. Uh, but I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions. Uh, uh, so let me let me just summarize uh, the important part of this lecture. I mean, we're going to we're stopping a little bit early. But the important con is that for thermodynamics, I want you to really understand, like I said before, how to apply the thermodynamic principles to your particular system. 